The first reading this morning is from Joshua chapter 24, verses 1 through 18. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons, Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I gave Esau the hill country of Seir to possess. But Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt with what I did in its midst. And afterwards, I brought you out. When I brought your ancestors out of Egypt, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued your ancestors with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. When they cried out to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. and made the sea come upon them and cover them. And your eyes saw what I did to Egypt. Afterwards, you lived in the wilderness for a long time. Then I brought you to the land of the Amorites, who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They fought with you, and I handed them over to you, and you took possession of their land. I destroyed them before you. Then King Balak, son of Zippor of Moab, set out to fight against Israel. He sent and invited Balaam, son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam. Therefore, he blessed you, so I rescued you out of his hand. When you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho, the citizens of Jericho fought against you, and also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, and the Hivites and the Jebusites. I handed them over to you. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove out before you the two kings of the Amorites. It was not by your sword or by your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored, the towns that you did not build, and you live in them. You eat the fruits of the vineyard and the olive groves that you did not plant. Now therefore revere the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served before the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Now if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served in regions beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, We will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did great signs in our sight. He protected us along the way we went, and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites, who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. The word of the Lord. Well, today, I have a confession to make. On my desk at home, I have two funeral sermons I'm working on right now, and I had the sermon for today, another sermon, and then a sermon for Labor Day weekend. So when I got up to go to church this morning, guess what? I grabbed the wrong sermon. (laughs) Even worse, I realized that just as I stand up to give it the sermon at the next service. So there I was. 
I'm going to just read a portion of one lesson for the Old Testament for the uh, first of September, and then the gospel for that day, and we'll go from there. So Moses commands obedience. This is from Deuteronomy 4. Now Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you to observe, that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord your God of your fathers is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. And there ends that lesson. Then I want to skip ahead to the gospel. And please stand for this. This is from Mark chapter 7. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to Jesus, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw that some of his disciples ate with bread defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. When the Pharisees asked Jesus, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat, bread with a, but eat bread with unwashed hands, he answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandments of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers, cups, and many other things such as you do. When he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand. There is nothing that enters a man from the outside which can defile him, but it, the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. For within come out of the heart of men all evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lawlessness, all evil eyes, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these come from within and defile a man. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. You remember growing up? Remember the rules? Sometimes I want to say to my parents, it's not fair. Johnny doesn't have to do that. Mary doesn't have to do that. To be honest, I don't remember a lot of rules growing up in our house. I guess we didn't need them. Or maybe I taught the rules at such a young age, I don't remember even learning them. I don't know. One thing I did know, though, is where the boundaries were. I knew what my folks would allow, and if I didn't know, I asked. <laughs> so I guess we did have rules, unspoken, unwritten rules, but rules that made sense, and we all understood now, if I were to define those rules, it all boiled down to these few things. Don't do anything that will hurt yourself. Don't do anything that will hurt somebody else. Number three, and the hardest one for me, don't embarrass the family. <laughs> and finally, whatever you are, wherever you are, wherever you go, try to leave things a little bit better than when you found them. Those are the laws of love that shaped our family. And they weren't bad. But Jesus really hit the nail on the head when it come, came to the laws of love. When some religious leaders tried to trap him with the question of what's the greatest commandment, he didn't answer with one of the Ten Commandments. Instead, he reminded them of the summary that Moses gave of the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 6, verse 30. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. That's the first and greatest commandment. Second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these, Jesus said, and he was right. If we could just keep those two commandments, we wouldn't need any others. But we don't. I couldn't keep my family's laws of love, 
we can't keep God's laws of love. So we need to spell things out a little bit more, which explains the Ten Commandments and all the other commandments that govern the people of Israel and that God said to hang on to in our first lesson for this morning. Now, all these rules were given to protect relationships, our relationships with God, with each other, and even ourselves and to keep us from hurting ourselves and others. That's the point of the rules we make for our kids, right? When we make a rule, we're just trying to protect them. Out of love. Unfortunately, though, well, first off, I want to say, those rules are meant as a gift. When my parents gave me sort of the boundaries, the rules, it was a gift. They wanted to protect me, and that's what the law, rules did. And that's the same way it is with all God's rules. They're there as a gift, especially for those times when we don't quite see it. Unfortunately, as with all good gifts, though, people have a way of turning them into something evil. And that's what Jesus was addressing in the Gospel lesson for today. The Pharisees had a fine way of playing what I call gotcha games. Kind of reminds me of politics today. It looks like one big game of gotcha where everyone's trying to find something they can hammer on the other party or other person. But the Pharisees like those gotcha games too. And they were the holier-than-thou types, which are still at today. They were always trying to add their two cents to God's law. An example could be like a rule against dancing. I lived in a church in central Minnesota, and it's hard to believe but this is true. A group of churches took over the school board, and they started making rules. Now, some of the rules were, you shall not dance. Okay, I don't know if you've been around a high school later, but how do you think a rule against dancing goes over? There's a movie called Footloose. If you haven't seen it, it might be worth seeing someday. But the whole point was that in the Bible, nowhere does it say you can't dance. In fact, Psalm 150 says, Praise the Lord with symbol and dance. And David himself, King David, danced before the Lord with all his might in prayer and praise. So these churches didn't like dancing, so they outlawed that in schools, and then they went on with all sorts of other rules. You can't smoke, fine, but you can chew, chew, you can chew tobacco, question mark. You can't gamble. The kids, truth, half the student body was not allowed to participate in school sports because it might lead to pride. So half the school student body, we had a big school, but half the students were not allowed to play sports. Name of the school district was Daskal Cato, by the way. Anyhow, they had other rules. Don't watch TV. I remember going to visit some of my friends from these churches. They would put their TV antenna inside the attic, and then there was these two doors in the living room. When company came, they closed them. When the uh, company wasn't there, they opened them so they could watch TV. And it, so it went. Christians nowadays, as well as in the time of Jesus, have a way of adding laws, creating laws, laws about drinking. You know, the Bible does forbid the, use of, the abuse of alcohol. But nowhere does it uh, criticize drinking in moderation. In fact, Jesus himself went to a wedding. In those days, weddings lasted seven days. And they ran out of wine. I don't know what day it was, but that could be a problem. So they asked Jesus to do something about it, and he said, okay. He makes six stone jars worth of wine. Now, these stone jars, which are used for purification, each held 30 gallons. How much wine is that? Six times 30 gallons, 180. Now, I'll divide that by four. That gives you a number of liters. <laughs> a lot of wine. Rules for sanitation made sense. You know, it makes sense to wash your hands before you eat, before you prepare meals. But where the Pharisees missed the mark is that they tried to make that into the big issue of sin. They were teaching human tradition like it was the Word of God. They were taking the law of love meant to protect people, and that's what washing hands was about, 
and turning into a law of oppression, which is bad enough, but then to make matters worse, they're replacing the law of love with other laws of their own making. You know, in today's reading, one example of Jesus' criticized had to do with a child's parents' responsibility to take care of their parents. But Jesus said to, you have a fine way of describing that rule. You say to people, well, if you leave your money to the will, to the church and your will, then you don't have to share that money with your parents while they're still alive. And they had all these ways of twisting things and getting them upside down and sideways. So some rules they added to, some rules they bent, some rules they totally disregarded, which might be the worst of all, for as Jesus said, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of God. And this was the charge Jesus was leveling against them. You abandon the, you abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Now, the long and short of it is don't mess with God's laws of love. It's all there for a reason. First, protect our relationships with each other, our relationship with God. That's the first use of the law, and perhaps the easiest to understand. God gives the laws of love for the same reason we as parents gave our children laws. It's because we love them and want to protect them. That's easy to understand. But the other reason God gave us laws is this. The rules and commandments are also there to drive us. They drive us to the cross of Jesus. And this is how that works. You know, it's so easy to fool ourselves into saying, I'm not such a bad person. I'm better than that person, so maybe I do a few things wrong, but hey, not as bad as them. We can always look for somebody who's messed up worse than we have and then say, well, maybe I don't have to deal with it. No. When we mess up, we too need to deal with our baggage, whether it is a habit we're trying to break, whether it is a grudge we're trying to hang on to, whatever it is out there that is separating us from God and each other. God wants us to deal with that. But we can't on our own. When we finally wake up and realize we can't be the kind of people we want to be on our own. That drives us to Jesus. That's when we go to Jesus and say, Lord, I messed up. And Jesus says, I know. I want to do better. And Jesus says, I know. And then he asks, are you ready to start? God's mercy always trumps justice. Remember, mercy trumps justice every time. So don't be too quick to judge others. Even when their sin is obvious, leave room for God's mercy. And that goes for your sins too. The steadfast love of God endures forever. And his is great. So don't be too quick to condemn yourself. It's a mystery of the church. I live that mystery in my own life. It's much easier to pronounce forgiveness and love for others sometimes than to forgive ourselves. I don't know how many times I've thought with people and they have a hard time believing that God has forgiven them. That God loves them. And that is part of our mission, to talk about God's love. And to say, God loves you. He knows what you messed up, but God loves you. And we do too. Right? A friend of mine says, God loves you, and I love you too. At least I'm trying. <laughs> we are not always the most lovable, but the love is there. And whether we show it by giving concrete gifts, food, clothing, shelter, 
or whether it's just being there for somebody and staying with them when everyone else has turned their back and trying to get rid of them. There's one time when Jesus was talking and the Pharisees were going after him once again and people started leaving him. And he turns to the disciples that remained and says, are you going to leave me too? And they said, Lord, where should we go? You're the one that has eternal life. You have the words, the forgiveness, the love. So just remember that when you fail, when another fails, that love trumps justice. So ask for God's forgiveness and then get back into living of that love. Living the laws of love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul and with all your strength and your neighbors yourself. Amen.